Good afternoon. Welcome to EduSet Network. Friend, you know today we are going to discuss a very important topic, democracy in India, representation and participation. You know democracy in India over the years have a strength and uh, when we see representation and participation, we find the different uh, social group and different, uh, a different level of participation and representation has increased. So we will try to understand its nature, but uh, still there are some issues we will try to uh, understand those issues and challenges and opportunity what we have at this moment. And at this juncture, when the, you have witnessed in the last uh, decade, the number of uh, activities at political level and social level is coming up. And for uh, that's why we are going to discuss the every aspect, the different aspects of the democracy in India uh, in respect to representation and uh, participation. And for discussion on this topic, we have in the studio eminent social science thinker, Dr. Vivek Kumar. He is a professor of uh, sociology in the Center for a Study of Social System in Jawaharlal Nehru University, a premier institution of the country. And he regularly uh, 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 writes in different uh, newspaper and magazines and uh, his face is known. He, you, you are watching him on the different channels every day. So certainly I think his view and uh, his uh, way of looking at the things will help us to understand this topic and give kind of insight how we look at the uh, democracy in India representation and participation. So on your behalf, I welcome him for the EduCert lecture on this very topic. Welcome, Thank sir. you. Thank you, Amrindi. And uh, friends, uh, nice talking to you today. And I think we'll uh, try to discuss the uh, topic that is democracy, part representation and participation, its nature. What are the issues involved in the democratic processes in the country? And of course, uh, what is the status of democracy in India? Is there a democracy, democracy deficit or deepening of democracy is taking place in the Indian society? To begin with, we all know that the term democracy is comprising of two terms, demos and kratos. Demos means people and kratos means to govern. So this is actually a combination of two terms. Now, we all know philosophically that democracy was present in India also uh, when we talk about gram panchayats. Uh, we saw that actually people participated in uh, gram, that is, uh, villages and village had panchayats in which people decided their issues uh, by participating in debates and discussion. So we had a tradition, but modern democracy as representative democracy, what we say is a Western concept. It emerged at a particular moment of time in Western societies. And of course, the revolutions different types of revolutions. One revolution I think people keep on mentioning, that is French Revolution marks the beginning of a democratic polity where the slogans like equality, liberty and fraternity emerged and the individual, individual rights, individual's rights were placed at the center stage and that is where the real fulcrum of democracy exists. So to begin with, in India, we all know that democracy emerged uh, uh, or you can say it's a gift to India uh, by the British. When British came to India, they tried to bring in sweeping changes in the structures of governance in India and of course the processes of uh, the governance in India. They introduced different institutions of democracy the uh, polity was one of them and politics they introduced also adult franchise through which people could elect. But there is an allegation friends that the British did not develop democratic institutions in the same manner as they did the development of uh, different uh, police state like army or judiciary or bureaucracy, they developed so much that uh, it really got established. But if you see the democratic politics, they did not develop so much the democratic politics, rather any 
issues, any efforts which were made for the development of democratic politics were suppressed by the British. So, they did introduce, the British did introduce democracy as far as the institutions were concerned, but they did not make an extraordinary effort to develop it. And therefore, we had to wait. We had to wait till 14th of August 1947 when India got independence and we moved into a different era. So, Indian democracy, the nation, Indian democracy took birth only very late in 1940s when we waged a, a, a revolution against the colonial masters. So, Indian democracy emerged out of a revolution against the colonial masters or colonialism as they say the British rule. After that, uh, we started our formulation of Indian constitution and it took 2 years, 11 months and 18 days to form our constitution. Friends, it was a long drawn exercise. The, the constituent assembly was formed and there were members and of course, Ambedkar piloted the uh, Indian constitution, but this all took 2 years, 11 months and 18 days and after that we passed our constitution. So, in the constitution we laid down the different ways and means. We laid down rights and privileges of the people. We laid down the sets of rule how to govern our people and therefore, the article 1 of Indian constitution is very important for us which says that India that shall be union of states. So, by that actually we see that there was a definition of Indian uh, in the Indian nation state and after that we gave ourselves different rights to the people and from there onwards the march onward march of Indian democracy began you can say in a formal sense of the term 26th of January 1950. So, that is the beginning of Indian democratic republic. We say it because we had a constitution, we had an independence government, independent government and also a independent nation. So, all was on our own. The destiny was supposed to be decided by people of India. People of India, that is what the preamble says we the people of India. So, we for the first time became people, citizens of a country, otherwise we were subjects. So, democracy accounts for citizenship and citizens have rights and these rights are enshrined in the Indian constitution. So, friends, we became a, a, a democratic country, a republic with a constitution, with democratic rights enshrined in the constitution on 26th of January 1950 and onward. Today, if we see, we are in 64th year of our republic and not even once in 64 years, we, we have seen that democracy is in peril or in danger. Day by day, day by day, in 64 years, we have seen that our democracy, specifically the political democracy, the transference of power from one regime to another regime has taken smoothly, very smoothly power has been transferred from one political party and the to the another. But if you see the neighboring countries, South Asian countries, we have seen that some countries did start as democracy, but what happened to them? They were trapped by dictatorship. Pakistan, Bangladesh, they were all trapped in dictatorship, but there were monarchies also ruled by kings, whether it was Bhutan whether it was 
Nepal, they were ruled by kings. But you have seen actually what is happening in Nepal. They are not able to formulate their new constitution. And therefore, they are not still a democracy in true sense of the term. So our democracy is safe. It is deepening. Now, we have to see representation, friends. Whether democracy has brought representation to the people, participation of the people, and how much people have been participating. So to begin with the structures, let us see the, uh, the type of polity which we have. If we see type of polity, India is a multi-party democracy. It has federal system of democracy, which means that there is an elected government at the national level and also at the state. Different states have their own government. There is also a government at the local level, that is village level, that is Panchayati Raj system. It was introduced with the 72nd amendment and also there is urban local government. Now, this democratic polity is run by another institution. As I said, it is multi-party system. So, if we see the number of political parties in India, according to 2009 election commission data, I found there were six, six national political parties and there are 47 state political parties. We can see the name of the national level uh, political parties, their year of formation and of course their current leaders. So we have Bhaujan Samaj Party, Bharatiya Janata Party, Communist Party of India, Communist Party of India, Marxist, Indian National Congress and Nationalist Congress Party. They are all considered as national parties. Why they are co called as national parties? because they have at least 4% of vote in four states or they also have 10% of seats uh, in that. So if we see this type of list, we only have six national parties, rest are all state parties and there are hundreds of registered parties. But we can see that representative democracy in India Principally, yes, India is a representative democracy as we can see that there are different levels of government, the national government, the state government and the local government, local both in the villages and of course they are there in uh, the uh, local cities as well. But the national government, if we see, how does national government function? The structure of the national government. If we see the structure of the national government, we can see that we have two houses at the national level of the polity. And these, this is known as parliament of our country. And in parliament, we have two houses. One that is Lok Sabha, that is House of People and the other is Raj Sabha, the Council of States. How many members are there in our uh, Lok Sabha, that is House of People and how many members are there in our Council of State, that is Raj Sabha. So we have 540 representatives elected directly by the people which go to the Lok Sabha, that is lower house of the parliament called as house of people. 543 represented elected from different states and union territories. Friends, we are talking about representation as well. So there are 79 seats which are reserved for scheduled caste candidates and 
there are also 41 reserve seats which are for scheduled tribes. So, we can say that you know uh, there are fair representation of the excluded communities that are called scheduled caste and of course, if you take number of scheduled caste in country in India, there are 1031 scheduled castes in India and you know this, this reservation is given, we call it as representation. This representation is given to the scheduled caste and scheduled tribes to the percentage of their population. So, virtually it amounts to be 15 percent of the population of scheduled caste and of course, seven and a half percent to scheduled tribe. But this comes not as it is, there is a provision, provision which is in the constitution of India and this is article 332 of Indian constitution. That means, the article 332 of Indian constitution reserves seats for scheduled caste and scheduled tribes to give them fair representation in the, in the modern polity, so that they can elect their representatives and through their representative they can participate and resolve their issues. Now, let us see the strength of Raj Sabha, the representation in Raj Sabha and uniqueness of Raj Sabha friends. Why Raj Sabha is unique and what is speciality and uniqueness of Raj Sabha. You can read the Raj Sabha little bit from there. The total strength of Raj Sabha which is the upper house of the parliament is 250 of which 238 are to be elected from different states. This is an indirect election. The member of legislative assemblies, the MLAs, they cast their vote for electing the Raj Sabha members and friends there are 12 members which are to be nominated by President of India. Now, these members, the nominated members can be from different field. They may be from arts, sports, education. You see Sachin Tendulkar was nominated to Raj Sabha by government of India. Sometime Lata Mangeshkar, Hema Manli, Vajanti Mala, they were all nominated because they were from the field of arts. Even Javed Akhtar was also nominated. So, uh, Shabana Azmi was also nominated. So, they were all nominated to the upper house to raise the issue of culture, art and sports. There are also members from education. Some, some professors were also nominated to Raj Sabha which is upper uh, house of the, uh, the uh, mm, parliament. But this does not dissolve any time. Just like parliament lower house that is Lok Sabha is dissolved every 5 years if, 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 if that is the term of the parliament is 5 years. But there is no term for Raj Sabha it carries on, but what happened that one third of the members of Raj Sabha retire every, every two years and therefore, one third is actually replaced. Therefore, what happens that the term of a Raj Sabha member is virtually six years, within six years he has to retire. So, this is representation at the national level. Friends, let us come to the number of representatives in the law Vidhan Sabha that is state assemblies and legislative assemblies there are 6002 Vidhan Sabha constituencies 
in 20 states. That means 20 states have Vidhan Sabha. Apart from the parliament, there are 28 states and two union territories. In this, you can see I have given you the number. Uttar Pradesh has the highest number of Vidhan Sabha seats, 404, followed by Andhra Pradesh and West Bengal, they have 395 seats, and Maharashtra, 289, and the rest actually the minimum is 40, which is Goa, and of course there are number of states which have seats numbering 60. Now each state Vidhan Sabha also follows representation of scheduled castes and scheduled tribes in accordance to the percentage of the population and this is given by article 332. So 330, article 330 reserve seats for scheduled caste and scheduled tribe in uh, Lok Sabha and article 332 reserve seats for scheduled caste and scheduled tribe in Vidhan Sabha. Therefore, we can see that there is a fair representation. I will come to participation of these people a little bit later, but I am just talking about that there is a fair representation. Representation at the national level, representation at the state level. Let us see representation of people at the local level, at the village level, at the at different levels. So we will find that uh, a, according to 73rd amendment of Indian constitution, constitutional amendment, there was Panchayati Raj, which was, in, this was introduced and it is handiwork envisaged by our late Prime Minister Rajiv Gandhi and of course, this is a very, very emphatic example of deepening of democracy in India, that Indian roots of Indian democracy, they are not only at the national level, they are not only state level, but they are going to the villages. And as they say, that India is still resides in villages, because 68 percent of India, Indian population is still lives in villages. And therefore, friend, it was a fantastically envisaged idea of democracy in India. But you see how many people, how many people were supposed to represent different stages. That means there are 2 lakhs, 40,355 gram panchayats in India and 6,317 block panchayats in different states. Now this whole population, that means 2 lakhs 40,355 40, people represent at the grassroots level and another 6,300 people are there at the block panchayat level. But friends, within this representation, there is further bifurcation of population. There is 37 percent of these people are women. That means 58,012 58, people, 12 persons are women who represent in the Gram Panchayat. Well, there is a debate that whether the women can represent or there are Pati Pradhans who represent their wives. That is a different debate. I am not going to come to that right now. But there is a fair representation of women. Then there is representation of scheduled caste also. And it is somewhere 32,690 people from the scheduled caste. That is roughly 20 percent, 22 percent of the scheduled uh, seats which are reserved for scheduled caste. And within scheduled caste also there are women and men both. And there are 11,364 uh, reserve seats for scheduled tribes. This is also uh, for men and women. So we have a fair representation of democratic representation of people at the grassroot level where women, scheduled caste and scheduled tribe. So in a way there is a strengthening of 
representative democracy in India where women, scheduled caste and scheduled type who and backward classes also who are considered as deprived sections of Indian society, they get fair representation. And therefore, it is said that theoretically, on the paper, in the institutions, there is a case of strengthening of Indian democracy. And Indian democracy is taking deep root. But friends, let's come to the uh, different version of the representation in India. Now, there are five elements which talk about or which can be considered as critical elements. Representation in Indian politics not only depends on the institutions or formal institutions, there are informal institutions also. The dynasty, the caste, the community, the communalism and regional identity, all are characteristics which influence the people to choose a, a person of their choice. We will come to that point a little bit later. But let us see, the Indian democracy right now, if we can talk about uh, Indian nation state and democracy has at least seven very important and critical institutions which need representation, which need democratic representation. That means they should be represented by the different population living in the country. These seven institutions are polity. I told you how in politics the reservation is there, judiciary and bureaucracy, industry, university, civil society, we call it as NGOs, media industry. And I am calling media as industry because there is profit orientation, there is taxation system and this media is, media industry is not a monolithic whole. There are three or four more components of media, print, television, there are 850 television channels in India. And out of that 180 channels today are paid channels. India produces 1000 films every year. So you can understand how big is the industry which is called as media industry. And of course, these institutions which I am referring, they are not only at a horizontal plane, they are vertically arranged. And what is that vertically arranged? There are state polities, there are local polities, there are state judiciaries and of course there are district judiciaries, there are state bureaucracies, national bureaucracy, industry also and universities, state universities, colleges and central universities, civil societies called as NGOs, the non-government organization which is funded by different uh, uh, agencies, international agencies and there are international uh, uh, um, NGOs like Oxfam, like uh, Action Aid India or many others. There are international, UNDP, UNICEF, all are international, DFID and PACS program which is running. This is all civil society, NGO organization which run in India and, 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 and they have become more and more important especially after the movement. Now, the media industry is also seeing. So, so, so we have different types of media. There are 43 national channels and you are seeing one of the channels which is a national channel, Prasar Bharti, uh, it, it gives that and there are 43 other channels of Doordarshan which are not commercial channels but they are of course part 
of our media. So, we have to understand the logic of the media. Media is not a monolithic whole. There are different in institutions, televisions are there and we have to add computer and, and, and internet. Now, the social sites are also selling so many goods and uh, doing businesses. So, in that sense, we have polity as well. Now, we come to the process. Till now, we were talking about structures of Indian democracy and structures means concrete structures based on Nadelian's, SF Nadel's definition of a structure. What is a social structure? Social structure is nothing but permutation and combination of roles and statuses dis distributed in a society. So, what roles and what statuses people have on the basis of that there are structures. So, parliament is a structure where people are distributed with roles and they have statuses. Similarly, Panchayat Raj institution is a structure, a state body, a state polity or a state Vidhan Sabha is also a structure. So, we were talking about structures, how people get representation in the structure and they are not getting representation in the structure just like that. They are getting representation in the structures by formally laid down rules in our constitution. So, you have to understand that we are getting our rights and privileges because our constitution and also as a citizen. We enjoy the status of a citizen. So, this is very important for us. But friends, I will just like to talk about the issues which are very much there in the contemporary Indian polity and as we see that India is gearing up for its 15th Lok Sabha. People are preparing, different political parties are preparing for themselves. Now, what are the issues of representation? and participation which are getting highlighted. One of the major issue which is getting highlighted in the Indian polity is the role of dynasty and this role of dynasty means that people are not getting proper representation and participation on their own rather their family, their parents, they influence their participation and representation in the polity. So, some people argue that there are different established families of the Indian society, there are different families in Indian society who are called as established families in the Indian polity. And their kins, their sons and daughters, they get representation easily in the Indian polity. This is considered and this is criticized, this is condemned and this is debated. So, this is one of the important element of participation and representation in Indian democracy that if you come from a highly mobile family, highly uh, developed and respected family then you may be getting representation easily. The second criticized part debated and discussed on and off part of Indian politics today is the caste. Representation of caste in Indian politics is a very important element and this we have to see that how this caste operates. How this caste operates in Indian politics? A very renowned political scientist, a team of political scientists, if you see very recently they were given Padma Bhushan by government of India. Susan Rudolph 
and Lloyd Rudolph, husband wife team of Rudolphs and Rudolphs, they have tried to, they had to try, they had tried to give a theory of mobilization in Indian politics. And what is that? That they have given that caste helps in the mobilization of individuals in politics. And they gave three types of mobilization. These are, these are vertical mobilization, vertical mobilization, horizontal mobilization, differential mobilization, and I have added one more ROE mobilization. We will see these three types of mobilization and I will also discuss the fourth type of mobilization. The vertical mobilization according to Rudolf and Rudolf is a type of mobilization when the local powerful castes, the upper strata of the society, they come and they try to mobilize the lower strata by giving them some allurement. They will say that, okay, we will give you free land to plow, please vote for me. Or they will say that, yes, I am your boss, I am your landlord, so you please come and vote for me and I will do this, this thing for you. So this is an allurement of the upper strata to mobilize the lower strata. This is the way Indian polity became in the syndrome of my bath culture. It remained for many years in the fold of my bath culture. But as the Indian polity moved, a little bit more, 60s and 70s, we saw a very different type of mobilization. Here, it was called as horizontal mobilization. Now, what is horizontal mobilization? As given by Rudolf and Rudolf in their book, Rudolf and Rudolf written a book called Modernity of Tradition, Modernity of Tradition. And in Modernity of Tradition, they have tried to highlight this type of mobilization known as horizontal mobilization. What is horizontal mobilization? It is a mobilization when the same status of caste. Earlier in vertical mobilization, it was higher caste which was trying to mobilize the lower caste. Now, it is the people with the horizontal status, same status caste, is trying to mobilize their own people. And Rudolf and Rudolf gave example of Tamil Nadu in which the Vanyars, they were trying, Vanyara caste or uh, Nadars, they were trying to mobilize their own status of caste. But how they were trying to mobilize caste? They were trying to mobilize these castes through forming caste association. Similarly, you find reddies in Andhra Pradesh, they tried to mobilize reddies and kamas, lingayats and vokaligas in, in Karnataka and yadavs and kurmis in Bihar and Uttar Pradesh, patidars in Gujarat, they were all trying to mobilize their own status caste by farming caste association and caste association was telling the people that look, we will give you, we will give you rights, we will give you education, we will give you other facilities if you vote for us and therefore they started mobilizing. So this was called as horizontal mobilization. If you want, you can read Modernity of Tradition by Rudolf and Rudolf. The third, the third type of mobilization is differential mobilization. In differential mobilization, friends, 
the agency of mobilization was not the notable elites of the area. It was not the caste association, but it was the political party. The political party started mobilizing people and political party tried to mobilize people in different ways. It the first and the foremost way to mobilize the, the people through political party was that they did through their ideology. They tried to mobilize to their ideology. Then they also brought caste and community both. So they gave tickets. For example, Pandit Jawaharlal Nehru, the first Prime Minister of India, gave a ticket to a Jat leader called Chaudhary Charan Singh from his own dominant area, that is Jat land, and he won the election. So they used to choose. Similarly, Jagjivan Ram, another Congress person, was given ticket in Bihar Sasaram where his caste people were dominant. So at that time, different political parties did actually choose a person from their from a constituency where his men were more or actually they dominated. So this was one of the way that the political party, political party tried to, tried to uh, mobilize people. Now there is also friend, you know Indian polity, religion is also used for participation and mobilization. And religion is used both positively and negatively. We must have seen that how communal frenzy just uh, 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 took over and communal frenzy was there because actually the politicians and Paul Brass, a great political scientist, have done work and he has tried to understand the communal rights, the politics of communal rights in India. And he says, he says that communal rights in India are orchestrated, they are planned by the politicians. They are not a natural phenomena, rather they are artificially created. And why it is created? He says that communal frenzy when takes place, it is not that communal frenzy will subside, but the politics after the communal frenzy has taken place. This is where we see that how people go there after communal rights, they start cajoling the victims of the, the communal right. They show them, look, they are the greatest saviors of that particular community. And because the community is in crisis, the community starts believing them also. And in this way, they win the trust of the people who are victims. And in this manner, communal rights and communal frenzy is basically used for political mobilization. But ROE mobilization is also a type of mobilization which we wanted to discuss. And this was the lowest strata of the society, the ex-untouchables, the backward classes, OBCs, and the tribals and the converted minorities, they came together and they form a political party and started mobilizing the upper castes also. So if you take UP as an example where Bahujan Samaj party is trying to mobilize and participate in democratic politics, what has happened? That the scheduled castes, the scheduled, the, the scheduled caste OBCs and minorities, they have come together, form a political party, and now they are trying to mobilize the upper caste, the Brahmins, the Kshatriyas, and the Vaishyas for their political gains. So this is Arohi mobilization, which is from below to up. And therefore, you can see that there is a very different type of participation. Now, in all, we can see a, a, another example of regional identity which is being created, which is being highlighted, which is, which is being 
uh, enacted and this is Maharashtra case where uh, Maharashtra Nirman Sena uh, is trying to mobilize people in the name of region and they say that look Mumbai belongs to uh, Marathis and therefore actually those who have come from outside they should go away and this was the case with Shiv Sena uh, earlier. So we can see that how regional identities, caste identities, communal identities and of course the family identities they are, they are used for mobilization and participation. Now because of this what has happened friend that we find certain section in the Indian society they have dominated Indian politics, they have also somehow monopolized the Indian politics and rest of the people they are still languishing behind and that is why we see new experiments which are coming in Indian society for that there should be greater participation. There was a representation but the participation is missing and that is why J.S. Mills used to say a good government is a government which not only gives representation to the aspirations of the people. A good government is not the government which only gives the representation to the aspirations of people but it also gives self-representation, self-representation to the people and self-representation is very necessary and that is why Indian society gave reservations, reservations to people and reservation in polity, reservation in bureaucracy, reservations in university and of course there is basically a increasing participation of scheduled caste and scheduled tribes but yet lot is to be desired and that is why we can see that there is a debate whether there is a democracy deficit or there is democracy uh, deepening of Indian democracy especially we have to see that this whole colonial legacy representation language slogans all will suggest that there is a case for deepening of democracy on one hand when we see structures but there is a democracy deficit when we see processes of people in participation and raising up their issues. Thank you friend. So, uh, uh, what, do, what is your comment on the present state of affairs? Is it um, uh, deepening or uh, we need to more uh, um, uh, democracy, participatory democracy as it is coming up? Uh, Recently we have seen and people are also coming forward, so how do you comment on this? But I, I you know, there is, a, as far as the structures are concerned, when we talk about parliament, when we talk about state, when we talk about Panchayati Raj, so as far as the structures are concerned, we can say that there is deepening of democracy. But when we talk about quality participation of people mm -hmm. raising their issues, uh, it is actually lot to be desired, especially when we see Pati, pati Pradhans, mm -hmm. that women do not go to the panchayat, it is, their, it is their husbands who participate. But yet there is lot of, lot of, you can say, empowerment of the women, just they are called as Pradhans. So still there is lot of scope for participation and that is why we see there are new actually experiments like Aam Aadmi Party which is taking place but I do not know yet actually it is too early to say for their future okay. that whether they will be able to give representation to the people or not. Okay, so what other ideas, what other suggestion you would like to make? I would like to make that actually that different institutions should be strengthened much more especially the politics the, 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 the teaching of the politics, the political methods, the institutions like for example nobody talks about constitution as a social science textbook. Mm -hmm. it, it can be read actually as a book, social book but it is only considered as a law book which is not correct. Mm -hmm. We get to know 
not only of the rights but also about our duties through the constitution article 51 a nobody knows about that that there are duties for citizens also so i think we should know first our polity and our constitution and therefore we come out and participate so that when we participate then and then only we can make our 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 uh, democracy is strengthened otherwise what will happen that if we don't participate for example a simple exercise of casting our vote we do not even as young persons we do not go for even casting our votes if you don't cast your vote that means you are not you are not giving the full credit to your democracy and you are not participating so if you only ask for rights and you don't give your duties you don't do your duties that means you are not actually strengthening our democracy so we have if you want to strengthen our democracy then mm -hmm. we will have to participate we have to give representation the composition when i was talking about the composition of the institutions polity judiciary bureaucracy industry university civil society and media industry the participation these institutions are still actually exclusionary okay. there are pe many people who are not participating women are not seen here actually very few women are seen in bureaucracy and industry university there are also scheduled caste and scheduled tribe and minorities and yet they are not participating so we need that these how to increase their participation mm -hmm. how to bring them to these institutions so that they can bring their own experiences once they bring their own experiences then we can actually think that look this is going to be much more stronger india that what we are seeing today so a kind of belonging sense of belongingness uh, sense of oneness that yeah. that is need to be inculcated yeah. into the masses so you have very well said that mm. if you come and participate mm. then there is belongingness also if you sit at home that look i am alienated mm. and i don't have anything to participate then actually the democracy will not get strengthened it is with the participation you get sense of belongingness that you are also part of this country and once you are part of this country then you feel actually motivated to do more and more if you don't come out if you don't participate if you don't see seek your rights then there will be alienation and you know alienation is very bad for our democracy we have seen how many young people who got alienated they joined different forces they 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 go and participate in violent forces actually which is uh, injurious for indian democracy okay so participation uh, cannot be imposed it uh, has to come from their own if they want to participate then uh, the things are not changing all the institutions are now open and giving a fair chance to participate so people have to take initiative also they should yes. not yeah, but i will say mm. ranji that there should be more such institutions mm. which are actually taking our these institutions towards people for example there should be more universities mm -hmm. which should be open in nook and corner we have open a university in amar kantak that is travel so we need more institutions we need actually more industries we need more civil societies we know we need more uh, media uh, actually training so that we all go and participate if if you see what is happening people you know a big lot is going abroad to take education foreign education mm -hmm. me media education why we do not have quality education within our country if we have that then of course the uh, the, the people will come to know the curriculum content of the university mm -hmm. also teaches representation it gives representation to the people and that will again bring more people to, on the board there will be dialogue and discussion and that is where indian democracy will be more strengthened okay so from both side we need to have uh, one side we have to take the infrastructure to the uh, um, da deep down to the people, masses to yeah. the masses and masses have to take initiative to participate and not only to participate also to demand and for the action from the people who are sitting on the top or i uh, say who are ruling the things yeah this is where actually when i see our 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 uh, 
participation from from national level in the parliament how many how many uh, mps they ask questions you know they do not ask many questions of their area mm. and therefore things are not taken care of how many people spend how many mps and mlas they spend their money in which is allotted to them so the, that is actually taken uh, out then you have a special component plan for especially designed for scheduled caste and scheduled tribe. We have seen and there are records where actually people are not able to spend the money which is spe specific for that people. Even scholarship are not distributed on time. So these are little policies and, uh, and measures which we can take to take things which we have. We have resources but the implementation of those resources, the uh, the entitlement which is given to the people that is not taking place and that is where somewhere democracy and governance they are actually intertwined and if you remove governance from democracy democracy will not be strengthened so our uh, entitlement comes from governance our our actually you know services which have to be given to the nook and corner of the people they come from governance and if governance is not actually uh, dovetail, it is not strengthened, it is not effective, then also there will be democracy deficit okay. in the country. Yeah, the, exactly. We have the resources, but we are not uh, going to, to disseminate. disseminate and govern well as it is required. Yes. Because if we do that, the people must certainly will get a benefit and the situation will change for the better. So, uh, 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 as you talked about the democracy deficit, it appears more the governance deficit which need to be taken on priority basis so that the larger section of the people get benefit out of it. Mm. So what the uh, options we have and how can we take it to the further? This, that is where I was giving you these seven institutions which are considered to be modern institutions mm. which are based on universalistic principles. Each polity we see that we are now seeing that there is a fair representation of people in Indian politics, mm -hmm. whether it is national level, whether it is state level, whether it is at the grassroots level, uh, in, in, in the gram panchayats, in block panchayats, or in the urban uh, municipal corporations. So we are having representation. In judiciary, there is still a lot of demand that representation of women, representation of Dalits, representation of minorities, this is lacking. I think we have to see that how representation. Then we see bureaucracy. There also the same problem of representation is there. Now in industry, we are seeing with the onslaught of process of globalization, there are actually people that the small scale and medium scale industries, they are not able to meet the challenges of the globalization. Then we see in university, the quality of the teaching in the government universities, this is also actually a worrisome thing. And our courses are not able to be tuned with the market, day-to-day -day market. And you know 65% of India mm -hmm. is going to be young. Mm -hmm. So India is going to be a young country. And we need to understand that how we can give education and occupation. If we are not able to meet this target, I think this dividend, demo, the, the, the demographic dividend will be also a very, very challenging thing in the future. Because we have seen even United States of America mm -hmm. is not able to meet unemployment problem. So if we are not gearing up ourselves, then we are not able to reap the benefit of our youth population. India is a young country. In comparison to China, India is a young country. And therefore, you see that China has changed its policy. From one person, one uh, child norm, they have gone to two child norm. Mm -hmm. Because they are thinking that they are not getting hands yeah. to work. So we have to think that we have hands. Now we need more work. So how we can generate in our democracy. Now, no debate in Indian politics is talking about occupation and right. employment generation. That is a very something when Indian politicians, mm -hmm. Indian politics do not talk about that, how they are going to generate more and more jobs for the future generation. I think mm -hmm. we, are, we, are, we are having a, a deficit of uh, democracy and governance both there. Okay. 
So, well friends, the, with the changing time we have to uh, tune with the occupation and other, uh, other aspiration of the people which want, they want to aspire, want to, uh, to cover. So, uh, with this word we conclude the lecture. We thank all of you for watching the lecture and on behalf I thank Professor Vivek Kumar for giving us such an insightful lecture. Thank you very much.